friends, uh, with lots of chances to discuss uh, ideas uh, on uh, quantum gravity, uh, both at the more theoretical level and also what one can try to uh, find out uh, experimentally or phenomenologically. And the work I'm going to talk about is uh, work in progress with Daniel Arteaga from Barcelona on uh, quantum light fluctuations as an interesting uh, way of probing, uh, as an interesting example of how to probe quantum metric fluctuations with massless fields. And the outline of the talk is the following. After the introduction, I will describe briefly the framework that I will be using, namely uh, perturbative quantum gravity as an effective field theory. And then I will tell you in this context how to probe metric fluctuations using uh, 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 how to probe them by looking at the effect that they have on the propagation of massless fields. And in particular, um, uh, I will use that to focus more specifically on uh, light cone fluctuations and try to define more, uh, in, uh, in a more specific definition of light cone fluctuations, an operational definition of light cone fluctuations, and try to make it more precise. Uh, in terms of, uh, of a gauge invariant, a different morphism invariant observable. And then I will uh, conclude at the end, uh, summarizing and emphasizing the main points uh, that we found and discussing some, some, further, some further aspects. Okay, so, so uh, low energy aspects of perturbative quantum gravity as an effective the theory has mainly been studied as, uh, by looking at scattering amplitudes on uh, flat backgrounds. All other backgrounds have also been studied, but also in, especially in the context of what I'll be discussing here in the sense of uh, effects on propagation of fields and also on reactions, uh, uh, modifications of, uh, of uh, standard model processes and so on as we've seen already in some here have been considered in this sense mainly of uh, scattering, looking at scattering amplitudes on mainly on flat backgrounds and in this context of, uh, of uh, low energy effects of perturbative quantum gravity, but especially looking at scattering amplitudes, corrections to scattering amplitudes. So what I'm going to talk about here is by looking rather than at scattering amplitudes at uh, uh, scattering elements, I'm going to uh, try to uh, study effects of metric fluctuations on the propagation of massless fields for finite times. So rather than looking at scattering amplitudes, which, which essentially correspond to st starting involving infinite times, starting with asymptotic initial times, asymptotic initial uh, states, and then looking at the asymptotic final states, I'm going to try to define things and study effects which involve finite times. So that's one of the main uh, aspects that I will be considering one of the main differences with the, with the usual studies. And, uh, and uh, once, uh, uh, and then I will try to uh, uh, implement these ideas by uh, trying to provide an operational definition of quantum light cone fluctuations based on the different morphism invariant of circles. And the whole point is that the, with the result that we are, that we are uh, developing, we, the, the, the point is that the, these ideas of quantum light cone fluctuations in many cases have been based on rather qualitative discussions, but what we are trying to do is try to provide a more systematic and quantitative framework uh, to discuss this and to do calculations of, uh, uh, of uh, different models. Uh, what I'll be discussing is uh, a rather conservative uh, framework, namely, essentially, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, effective field theory, so the direct extension of the direct marriage of, uh, of GR with quantum field theory, so it's a rather conservative approach, but the point is that there are a number of subtle aspects, and it's important to make sure that one understands all those uh, very carefully, to make sure that uh, those are properly understood, so that then when you try to uh, look at other uh, theories perhaps of quantum gravity that have some uh, modifications, non-trivial modifications in the microscopic regime, 
that one does not get confused with some of these subtleties that should be properly understood uh, within the simpler framework and you don't mix up the non-trivial uh, contributions that you get from the, these uh, non-trivial microscopic modifications and some of these subtleties that you already had in the simpler framework. Are you going to discuss uh, linearized gravity in a background or...? In the end, most of the calculations, as you will see, will boil down pretty but much... But you're going to the invariant in general, not only in the first order. Right, so as you will see toward the end of the talk, the idea is that to do things properly, you should start with an observable uh, that is properly defined as a diffeomorphism invariant. The right way to proceed, ideally, is to start with an observable which is diffeomorphism invariant in general, but then, uh, in practice, the calculations that we will be doing here will be at essentially linearized order. But in principle, what you would like to do is indeed define an observable which is diffeomorphism invariant, uh, observe, uh, diffeomorphism invariant in general, but then you particularize to a linearized calculation at the end, yes. Okay, and so as I said, there are these two aspects that uh, the important thing is, so it's trying to provide a framework where you can do systematic and quantitative studies, but it's also very useful in trying to be very systematic to uh, to phrase properly and clarify a, num a number of uh, subtle and conceptual questions. And I try to illustrate that in a number of relatively simple uh, examples and, 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 and relatively simple background space times, as we will see, but uh, uh, where there are some subtleties that I think have already been a little bit uh, confusing in the literature. But it's also one of the motivations, the original motivations for us was also much more interesting uh, situations um, from a theoretical point of view. Uh, so one of the motivations for us was actually understanding uh, and even how to define properly the question of uh, quantum fluctuations or black hole event horizons in the infrared regime. So as I said, this framework it is trying to define things properly and understand them is it's both trying to define things uh, properly and making sure that one has the, the calculation appropriately both in maximum calculation that are important phenomenologically, the ones that I'm going to describe here, but also, uh, they are also interesting in much more, uh, you know, much more uh, interesting from a theoretical point of view situations like, for instance, uh, quantum fluctuations of black hole event horizons. Okay, so let me try to uh, get into a little bit more into the details. So, um, some of the some of the uh, researchers who have actually studied in, uh, studied these problems in some in some uh, uh, in some quantitative matter in some quantitative way are actually Larry Ford and some of his collaborators. And the way they have actually studied these quantum like fluctuations is in, in, in the context of linearized quantum gravity. What they have studied is actually uh, the propagation of null geodesics in linearized quantum gravity. And um, uh, so what they have done is that they have studied uh, the propagation of a single null geodesic in linearizing this fluctuating, this uh, quantum fluctuating uh, linearized uh, metrics. And uh, the situation that they have considered is either non-trivial states, could be thermal states, could be squeezed vacuum states on a simple background space-time, flat space-time, or they have also considered non-flat backgrounds, could be some, uh, although those they have not considered in great detail, uh, they, it could be, for instance, a black hole space-time. They have also considered other flat background space-times, but with uh, non-compact, uh, oh, sorry, with compact extra dimensions of size L, and I'm going to, we are going to discuss also those in some detail here, and compare what, what we will be doing. The main reason why they consider always these kind of situations is because of the following. Since they consider a single null geodesic propagating on this uh, uh, fluctuating uh, geometry, this fluctuating, this perturbation, so they consider, a, uh, suppose that they consider a flat space time, Minkowski, and these perturbations that they quantize, linearly quantize, uh, they, they quantize these linear perturbations around this flat space time. Now, if you have a non geodesic which is propagating uh, around this, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a few more details later on, but essentially the point is that you will need to uh, evaluate two-point functions along this geodesic. Now, if you have two-point functions along this geodesic, you have to consider two-point functions of this, uh, in this case, these uh, metric perturbations, but just think of a scalar field uh, in, for points which are null related. 
that's a highly divergent object. And so that's one of the main problems, that they have to deal with these objects which are highly UV divergent. And so what they have to do is that they essentially have to, they perform a subtraction. So what they do is that they just subtract this quantity, which is divergent, in, in, in from the flat space case, from the vacuum, the Minkowski vacuum in flat space. So that's essentially why they cannot calculate this quantity for the flat space case, which in principle should be a finite quantity when you do it properly, and I'll explain how to do that. But in their case, the way they proceed is that for the calculation with a single null geodesic, they get a divergent result, formally divergent result. So what they do is that they just subtract that, but then of course they cannot get the non-trivial result for the Minkowski vacuum in flat space. So they only get non-trivial results for other space times or other states. Because in that case, what they get is the difference with respect to the Minkowski vacuum in flat space. So I'm just describing uh, the kind of calculations they do and why they get non-trivial results uh, in, all, all, uh, in, all, in all those other cases. Essentially because they do this subtraction. But whether that's really legitimate and what's the meaning of that? Well, that's a little bit questionable. And there's also this other aspect that I'm going to describe here. Okay? So, but the main point is when they do these kind of calculations, for instance, let's focus in this case of uh, essentially the, uh, the vacuum state in this situation where they consider flat backgrounds but with a compact extra dimension. Let's say a five dimensional space time with a single compact extra dimension of size L. Then in that case, let's, uh, they essentially characterize these quantum light cone fluctuations by looking at the fluctuations of the time of flight. So, by looking at this, uh, so when you consider time of a total time of flight that in the mean would correspond to a time of order capital T, and then the size of the extra dimension, as I, as I of the extra dimension, as I said, is of, is, of, uh, is given by this capital L. Well, then it turns out that the result that they get was for this time of uh, flight fluctuations initially uh, several years ago, five years ago, or actually a little bit longer than that, they got a, a, a dependence which was actually more significant, but in a revised result uh, just a few years ago, uh, recently, one or two years ago, they actually realized that they found they corrected the result that the dependence is much, is much smaller, but nevertheless it increases with time and it has this kind of behavior. This is the plan length. Okay? So it does increase, not as significantly as they had found before, but it does increase with the total time. And it also has this funny behavior. Notice that when the size, for instance, of the compact dimension goes to zero, this sort of diverges. Diverges, not as in the previous results that they had found, this was a power law rather than a logarithm. But it, so now it's more slowly, but it nevertheless diverges when L goes to zero. But I so suppose this means that the linearized approximation in which they did it breaks down. It's not clear when the compact dimension goes to zero, that uh, their approach is the correct one, because they are based on weak gravity. Yes, however... So, yeah, it's not clear whether it's physical, that's all I mean. Right, however, the point is that when you look at their... That's true, that uh, on the one hand you could question that, but however, when you look at, the, at their calculations, you could also... It's true that you might question that when that size goes to zero, the linearized gravity approximation might break down, but on the other hand, you could also question that even though that's true, you could also question that nevertheless, that even though that calculation should uh, break down in that limit, you look at their calculation and you might also find, in fact this is probably this comment that I'm going to mention here, you would, you would not expect that, that even if that calculation is just assumed that the calculation itself physically, you forgot about this point, and you just look at the calculation and you assume that it were valid in that regime, whether you would expect this limit to give you that result or not. And the point is, well, so this is this comment here, that essentially you could interpret, even though they don't do the calculation in that way, you could interpret that this limit should give you a decoupling because you could interpret their calculation in terms of Kaluza Klein modes and you would interpret that when this, uh, the, the size of this extra dimension goes to zero, you would expect a decoupling of the power of Kaluza Klein modes. So you find a little bit strange this result, that when L goes to zero, even though I agree with you, but nevertheless you can just say, okay, forget that about the interpretation, just take this calculation, would I expect this uh, decoupling to whom when the size of the extra dimension goes to zero? Yes. I, I'm concerned that the expression doesn't seem to be the Lorentz invariant from the brain. On so the brain, right, so... Well, yeah, yeah, this time is measured by some observer, measured by some different observer, this time will be different. No, it's the proper time. It's the proper time. It's the, right. the proper time of light, so it's zero. Of light? It's of light. The time of light. Of light. Of light. Of light. Of light. Of light. This is the time. This is the, the no. So let me try to explain. 
So this is, uh, in fact, I have, well, I have a picture later, but so essentially you have two, you have two, uh, so you have two observers, so you have two, uh, roughly speaking, you'll see later on a picture which is much more detailed, but suppose that you have two observers which are separate by a distance which is given by C capital T, roughly speaking. In one frame. In one frame. Okay. And <coughs> so the time of flight in average would be given by C times capital T. In that frame, okay, and uh, and so they do this calculation in the fluctuation zone of the uh, time of flight. In but which frame? I, but in which frame do they do this calculation? They do this calculation in a particular frame. So I agree with you that there's also this issue of trying to understand <coughs> whether this. Uh, I, I agree with you. This is also no, another aspect. In I fact, I'm going to say, say, say because this I studied carefully. I know mm -hmm. what Larry Ford did. I mean, I'm talking about Ford and you, not not the. the Yes. He showed this is not actually the time of light, okay? This is the time of the two events because he does the geodesic separation. Essentially, he considers two parts. Uh, he will show. I'm, I'm sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm going. In fact, perhaps okay. perhaps we can wait a little bit sure. because this point about the uh, Lorentz invariance. So I have a few more things to say about that. So just to answer so, Daniel's so question, I'm, it's the time in the traceless transverse yes. gauge which is proven to be the proper time of the two so, events. So, I'll, I'll say a few more things about this. I'll say a few more things about this. So, perhaps uh, we can discuss that at the end. Because, I, in fact, I have a few more things to say. So, my whole point is that the, there are a number of things about this setup that I'm not really very happy about. So, that's what I'll try to actually develop a bit more and try to give, in my view, a more solid uh, foundation for this. So, I agree with you that this is something one could question. I mean, this issue of Lorentz invariance of this result. That's something that they want to... Fork for sure, as I said. So, so, let me, so, so, let me, so let me try to point out some of this. Uh, so this is not the point that I was emphasizing here. But uh, I'll say a few more things about that. Okay, so the point I, was, I wanted to emphasize here, but there are a few others that maybe I'll mention at the end. Uh, one was this aspect of decoupling, okay? And uh, as, as, as Nick was mentioning, it's not that you are going to trust the really the linearness, but just as a you just uh, as a check of the calculation in a sense. Uh, what would you expect? And so this, there's this expectation from the point of view of a practical physicist that you would naively expect this decoupling of the tower of Kaluza Klein modes. That's one thing. Another aspect is that very naively you would expect that just based on the idea of energy momentum conservation in, of a calculation in flat space, a sort of a scattering amplitude you would expect to get a zero uh, result for your scattering amplitude. If you think in terms of this problem as a, as a, as a scattering amplitude, uh, think of this uh, as a scattering amplitude problem of your, of your, uh, of your null geodesic or a field corresponding to a massless field corresponding to the null geodesic with gravitons. In fact, perhaps not so much for time of flight, but for the uh, similar problem that they also discussed in connection with this, which corresponds to the broadening of the, of the spectral lines. Uh, so then you would expect that at least for long times that you would get uh, essentially no effect, or certainly no growing effect with time. Very naive, very naive. This is just a motivation, an introduction. So th those are some, some, some remarks. And then what I'll try to see is that I'll try to provide then a more detailed discussion, more calculation, and then at the end go back and see what the, the, the results that we get, how they compare with these expectations that uh, I was mentioning here. Okay, and then just to conclude with this uh, introduction, then uh, I just wanted to mention that in this general discussion, well, I just felt it was important to mention something that I will get hopefully at the very end in my last slide, which is that when discussing quantum light point fluctuations and so on in this very, very general setting with this very uh, conservative approach for the microscopic needles and this effective field theory approach for, for uh, gravity, or quantum gravity, uh, well, what is the relation with estimates of uh, relatively large uh, uh, fluctuations in the context of, in the context of space-time foam? Uh, there are many models for space-time foam if based on different ideas of the microscopic details, but there are some which are based on, in principle, we would think, on relatively minor assumptions, just on uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle and so on. So it would seem that those are very general, and what I'm going to discuss here should fall into that category, and so one should say something about that. So I'll try to say something, if I have some time, at the very end, in, the, in, the final, in, the, in my final slide, final discussion slide. So it just, 
something I should keep in mind. So I'll try to say something at the end. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm thinking and going a little bit slowly. So let me let me try to say. So, 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 sorry, before uh, I proceed, I don't want to slow you down, but just to understand what's going on. Uh -huh. Taking L to zero means, I mean, is really the coupling limit, so you take the mass of the closer client states to infinity, yes. right? Yes. So, but this limit could be broadened because at the same time when you perform this limit, you also have a discontinuity and a decrease of freedom in your system. Uh -huh. Because if you have closer client states, you have, you have kind of massive gravitons as well propagating around, and they have more decrease of freedom than mass as well. Well, so you have you have the massless ones, and then you have these additional. Yeah, but those you have now decoupled. So what this limit does is is a very naive way to do a decoupling limit because yes. in some sense this limit is discontinuous in the number of degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. So we would not expect that this is a smooth limit. It never is. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm not sure whether it's a problem. So you think that. You, it's not clear to you, it's not completely clear to you that this limit should necessarily... Yeah, take ordinary mass of gravity, yes. if you just let m go to zero, say, that the, ma the mass a of the graviton, the mass of the graviton, the one over l, yeah, mass goes to infinity, I understand. Yes. But at the end of the day, you end up with massless gravitons on the brain. Yes. In the decoupling, what you call decoupling. But my point is, this is not a proper decoupling limit, because by doing so, you have a discontinuity in the number of degrees of freedom in the system. Before you have massive gravity, at the end you end up with massless gravity. No, but be, be careful because this is a little bit different. So here you have you have the massless gravitons and the power of massive. No, sure, but those like. you have decoupled now, right? Right, but the massless are always there. So sure. it's not that you the sure. massless are always there, and then you on top of that, in addition, you have the massive ones. No, all I'm saying so you start mm -hmm. out with a theory that has, depending on the background, say the Tsnikovsky five degrees of freedom. <laughs> And then you do what you call a decoupling limit, and you end up with a theory that has two degrees of freedom. No, but the, so this is perhaps we should not spend too much time with that and leave it for the end because it's really just a minor point in my introduction. No, so but I think that's really very important whether there is a problem or not. I mean, this kind of discontinuities are known. Yeah, but so I think that you mean this fandom uh, discontinuity for, so for the yeah. masses. So yeah. let's discuss that because that's when you when you take the massless limit. But what I'm saying is that the massless part here is always massless. Sure. So in that sense, it's different. It's not that you are taking the massless limit and you go from no, five to two. So. The the massless part is always two here. But and you end up with a massless theory on the brain. Okay, so maybe we can discuss that at the end because after all, this is really not. Uh, it's just a motivation, and then at the end we can we can see whether when we do the more detailed calculation, in the end you have this behavior or not. But we can discuss that at the end. Okay, so. Uh, uh, yes, so this is the framework. Uh, so perturbative, what I will be working with is perturbative quantum gravity, regarded as an effective field theory. The point is that the perturbative quantum gravity, you start with some background in general, it can be a general background. You consider perturbations around that background, you quantize them. This was considered a long time ago. It was immediately realized that the theory is perturbatively non-renormalizable. Initially, this was considered a problem. It was essentially disregarded. Uh, it's certainly a problem if you want to study the theory, you know, in the UV as a fundamental, as a complete theory. Nevertheless, if you're interested in the infrared regime, it, well, nowadays we know that it can, one can still make sense of it as an effective field theory. And uh, in fact, effective field theories are nowadays very successful in condensed matter, uh, particle physics, even uh, nuclear physics. Uh, and the important thing is that we have this large scale separation between the infrared regime, where you are interested, uh, the scales that you're really interested in, and the much higher energies when you know that your effective field theory, the fundamental scale where your, your, your effective field theory breaks down. And, well, the limitation, of course, is that you can only study this infrared regime with these effective field theories. On the other hand, the, the, the positive aspect is that then it's relatively insensitive to the microscopic details of the, in, the, in the UV sector. So even if you don't know the microscopic details, of your theory, you can still, uh, even if we don't have a complete theory, the UV, we don't know the UV completion of quantum gravity, we can still use this kind of description, and it's relatively insensitive to the UV details to study the infrared region. Okay, so uh, so this effective field theory description for quantum effects uh, of the gravitational interaction in this regime for length scales much larger uh, than the fundamental length of quantum gravity that can be 
the plan length or can be another it doesn't it doesn't necessarily the, the fundamental scale of quantum gravity doesn't necessarily uh, it doesn't need to be the, the, the plan scale uh, it can be a much lower energy scale either if you have extra dimensions or if you have a large number of fields as we as we as it was reminded to us in, in the in, the, in on, on Monday by um, and the whole the main points uh, to keep in mind when you have an effective field theory are what is the field content so in this case uh, the gravitational field, as usual, I mean the, the usual field content in, in GR, plus the matter fields. In this case, I will be considering some some uh, essentially massless. In, in this case, I will be focusing on the massless uh, scalar field. And what are the symmetries of the theory? Well, in this case, the fundamental symmetry is diffeomorphism symmetry together with local Lorentz symmetry. Although that's what I will be considering here, but this treatment can also be. Uh, naturally generalized to cases where, for instance, you break Lorentz symmetry, you can sort of extend this kind of treatment to situations like that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the main point is that you can encode the UV effects in local terms uh, suppressed by, by inverse powers of the fundamental energy scale of, uh, of uh, quantum gravity in this case. But here I just uh, don't commit to necessarily being the, the, the plan scale. And in addition, uh, so you have these uh, local terms that will encode these, these positive powers of the of the Riemann curvature and also derivatives of the of the of the matter field. So I'll be, I have another slide where I'll show this a little bit more explicitly with equations. And then there's uh, this additional point, which is that when you start doing calculations with Feynman diagrams, then what you see is that in addition, uh, when you start doing calculations with loops. This is not something I will be using in this in this uh, work that we presented here, but in more general, when you do other kinds of calculations, what you see is that when you do calculations with and, and consider you know loop corrections, what you see is that uh, the numbers of the, the Feynman diagrams are suppressed. The numbers of loops diagrams with an, an even number of loops are suppressed by inverse powers of the square of the Planck mass. Uh, so as many as many loops as you have are suppressed by powers of the of the, of the square of the plan mass, not, not this power. So essentially, the origin of this is the weakness of the, of the gravitational interaction. That's what is suppressing the powers of uh, uh, the, the, the numbers of loops. So roughly, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this slide, this is really from some talk of some other work that I had, but it's, it can still be used here. Essentially, the main point is that here, uh, we would be interested in diagrams where you have external legs that, uh, that correspond to matter fields. So it would be not wavy lines that are gravitons, but matter fields. But, so it would be diagrams where you have essentially external lines with, with, uh, with straight lines. And the point, as I said, is that in this context, you would be doing calculations with, uh, you have these arbitrary uh, uh, positive powers of, uh, of uh, powers of the, of, the, of the curvature, which are suppressed by this uh, energy scale of quantum gravity can be the Planck scale but to be a lower energy scale and similarly for powers of the curvature and also derivatives of your matter fields and then as I said you would have these additional vertices which are further suppressed those vertices would also appear in general in your in your loop diagrams and the loop diagrams are also suppressed but this is a different scale in general because of the weakness of the gravitational interaction by inverse powers of the now, in what I will be describing here at the end, I will be essentially focusing in diagrams that don't involve loops. Those will be, will be suppressed by uh, inverse powers of the time mass. I'll be doing calculations here to lowest order. So I will be focusing on these kind of things. But again, I mean, so I was sort of recycling this slide. I apologize for that. Here it will correspond to diagrams which involve only uh, external lines, or some of the, the relevant diagrams would have external lines which would be matter fields. Okay, so uh, how to probe metric fluctuations with massless fields? So we want to determine the light cone structure by sending these massless fields, these massless particles, and measuring the time, the time of flight. Now, in the absence of gravity, for the moment, just for a second, the way to obtain sharper light cones is by considering, on the one hand, uh, high frequency modes so that you have less interaction, and also to consider coherent states with many, many quanters. So essentially, having this. Uh, this classical electromagnetic waves, if you wish, or uh, rather than a single one. So you want to have a very sharp peak over the, the vacuum fluctuations. So I'm not going to spend too much time because I'm running out of time.
And the additional point is for the calculation that we are going to do, uh, we will be using, to make our calculation our life simpler, we will be using a geometric optics approximation so that uh, these wave modes uh, will be approximated by rays that uh, will correspond to null geodesics at the end of the day in the calculation. This will be valid for uh, uh, when, the, when the wavelength of the modes of the gravitational perturbations uh, are much larger than the wavelength of the, of the mode of these uh, of this, uh, masses field that we are considering, that, for, that we are using to probe the metric fluctuations. Uh, in that regime it's valid for most of the gravitational waves that are much shorter then this approximation in principle would not be valid but in, in fact what happens is that if you consider a bundle of null geodesics they, their effect will like, essentially be smeared out and they will not <coughs> contribute but this is a point which is important because if you just consider a uh, single geodesic they give you a UV divergent but if you consider a bundle they are essentially smeared out and they don't give you a contribution so this is one of the differences I have to go a little bit quickly, sorry about that. But so then the point is that you consider, we're going to consider in this geometric optics approximation, this non geodesics. This is also partly reviewing in some more detail, and this part is also similar to what they were doing. You consider non geodesics, here I'm simplifying a lot uh, because I'm just considering propagation along uh, uh, <coughs> one direction. You have to do it in general, you have to you do it in general, but very quickly. Uh, so you have, you can just consider this null geodesic and then you look at this uh, time of flight. So, so you, essentially you just have to solve the, 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 the geodesic equations on this perturbed uh, geometry. You would get from there the time, the time of flight uh, on this perturbed geometry. And then uh, you have to now calculate the fluctuations on the time of flight. You can get that by essentially calculating the uh, the correlations, and so the object which is involved on to get the fluctuations of the time of flight is the is the, the two point function of the of the metric. This is an operator in the NIS gravity at the order we are working at the lowest order. So you have to calculate this two point function. In their case, they calculated this object in the TT gauge. So I'll say a few more things later on because you can calculate this in different gauges. Now, an important thing is that. Because of the, what I mentioned earlier, we are going to calculate this object uh, smeared with a bundle of null geodesics. So I uh, did not write this explicitly here, but really this integral rather than along a single geodesic is actually smeared along a bundle of null geodesics. And another aspect which is, turns out to be very important is that in addition of this smearing along the transverse direction, you also have to be careful with the switching on and switching off in the initial and final time. That turns out to play a crucial role. And then, well, the calculations, so you have this total time, and then you have uh, some, a scale which corresponds to the switching on and switching off scale. Then it turns out that the calculation is convenient to do in Fourier space. This would be just a Fourier transform of this, of this function. Let me hurry a little bit. Uh, okay, and so when you do that, this is a sort of simplified version of doing uh, very similar to the calculations that Larry Ford and his collaborators were doing, it's just that we do it in Fourier space. I could tell you a little bit why, in our view, it's a bit more convenient and quicker to do it in Fourier space. But including essentially the main point besides doing it in Fourier space is including this switch on function. That's one of the really key points. And then when you do that, your result is fairly different. First of all, we can get the result just in 4D. They had zero there because they had to subtract the divergence that they, they had. We can get the result in 4D, for me, cost in 4D. You get this result. You get this growth in time. I'll tell you afterwards what the interpretation is the, of this growth in time. Then you have this switch on scale. But more inter interestingly, then you have this result for five dimensions with compact extra dimension. That result has the same result that you get in the limit of, small, of a size which is small as compared to the switch on time, which is kind of, well, at least to discuss this issue of decoupling is kind of meaningful because otherwise if the size of the switch on were uh, much smaller than the, 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 the size of the extra dimension then you would naturally be exciting those Kaluza at time modes when you're switching on. Um, okay, so uh, the result that you get is the same that you have in four dimensions and then you get this correction terms. And you see that indeed when you consider uh, uh, this limit or at least when you consider else which are much smaller than the switch on time, indeed your expressions have this decoupling, this uh, result of the, the decoupling limit is satisfied. 
So that's the naive expectation that I was mentioning. Okay, so now uh, let me just a little bit quickly get into this uh, discussion. Yes, yeah, so I know that now it's the 13th, but I think I have three slides or so to, for the more general uh, discussion. So this was mentioning, uh, sort of reproducing these calculations that they had, but being a little bit more careful about this uh, bundle of nodules as it's trying to, uh, this starting with quantum field theory calculation and recovering via, via the geometric optics approximation, uh, how the, the, the non-geodesics appear there, but you have to consider this bundle of non-geodesics, this uh, switch on, switch off, and how you get then these final results, and in particular how you get then this, uh, this, uh, this the degree poverty decoupling thing. But now let me tell you a little bit more about uh, how to implement properly this uh, operational definition of light cone fluctuations in terms of gauge invariant observables. So very quickly, uh, when one, this is actually a highly non-trivial aspect, as many of you uh, know, how to define observables in quantum gravity, and it really doesn't not, doesn't have much to do. Well, or in addition to problems of uh, the microscopic details or a microscopic uh, completion of, of of gravity, but even in the infrared sector, how to define diffeomorphism in very observables is a crucial point when you consider quantum gravity, <coughs> so that your results are independent of the particular gauge fixing. And that is important in, in classical GR, but it's crucial in quantum gravity. And the point is that when you try to define this kind of, of observables, you are generically led to consider non-local observables. <coughs> and you can try to find ways of uh, getting approximately local observables, starting with these non-local ones. Uh, now, well, I have to go a little bit quickly, but uh, so we will focus on starting with these kind of non-local observables and some which essentially correspond to intrinsically geometric uh, objects, relational objects, in terms of uh, the perturbed metric before taking the quantum matrix. So that, uh, oh. so so that in particular, for instance, when you take the quantum matrix, the result that you will get should be independent of the particular gauge fixing that you took. And at the perturbative level that we, at the order, at the perturbative order that we are working, that essentially corresponds at the end uh, to taking averages, for instance, over rotations, over boosts. Um, if you take gauge fixings like the TT gauge or uh, the, the Feynman, the Lorentz gauge, which are uh, invariant under rotation, then you don't really need to take the average of the rotation, but for instance, over boost can be important because the TT gauge is not uh, invariant under boost. So that question that, uh, that Daniel Sudaskin was asking might actually play a role here. Um, so I think I have two or three slides left. So, so let me tell you, I spend a little bit of time uh, so explaining the kind of uh, geometric uh, observable that, that we are considering, how to implement this uh, uh, observable, uh, this operational definition of light cone fluctuations. So the idea is the following. Uh, the picture I'm giving you is, uh, is based on the following idea. This is described in terms of the coordinates here, or the picture here, is in terms of, of this uh, background, flat uh, space-time background coordinates. Okay, this is an perturbed background coordinates. Now, then we consider the metric perturbations, and uh, so I'll start by considering the following construction. So I start with a given uh, geodesic, time-like geodesic here. I start with a point in the time-like geodesic, and now I want to consider an orthogonal uh, space-like geodesic with a fixed physical distance. Now, for different metric perturbations, for different, these are quantum, but let's talk in terms of realizations as a, with an abuse of language. Well, since I want to consider fixed physical distance for different realizations, in one case I will end up here, in another case I will end up here, with this description that I'm using in terms of coordinates, in terms of the background space time, in terms of the unperturbed background space time. And then after a fixed physical distance, in one case here, in another case here, then I parallel transport this vector here, I parallel transport here, and then I have a, another time-like uh, geodesic that goes up in this way, similarly here. Okay? So then I have this construction. In other cases, because of the metric perturbation, this time-like geodesic will actually follow this trajectory in terms of these background coordinates that I'm uh, plotting here. Okay, and now from this point, this original point here, now I emit this uh, this uh, light cone with this massless field, 
this will intersect the second time like geodesic and from that point of intersection I would emit another light cone and so forth okay and, I, and then I measure the proper time along this time like geodesic and similarly here and those are what I call tau 1, tau 2, tau 3 so these are some of the observables and it turns out that it's convenient to consider <coughs> other observables which are for instance these ratios of these times those are useful because for instance those get rid of some uh, dependence which has some significant uh, dependence on the fluctuations that are due to this uh, trying to keep uh, this uh, there are some large fluctuations that are due to the fact that I insisted on on, uh, on, on uh, starting with this fixed physical uh, distance at the initial time but if I consider these ratios that dependence on the fluctuations that come from this fact of starting with a fixed uh, physical uh, initial distance cancel out so there are some of these observables which are fairly sensitive to that. And so these are the kinds of observables that I wanted to consider. And now there's this other point that, uh, well, not just very quickly, but in principle, to be sure that uh, you have this uh, uh, gauge invariant or diffeomorphism invariant observables, one would need to take averages over, uh, take a Lorentz transformation along this direction if over different boosts and take, uh, take an average over all the possible boosts. And one has to be a little bit careful about that because the Lorentz group is non-compact, so those are things that are a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, subtle. And the whole point is that one wants to check that you get the same result when you use a, a, a covariant gauge like the Feynman gauge or the Lorentz gauge, the harmonic gauge, and the TT gauge. Um, okay. Uh, and let me just, since I'm running out of time, uh, let me just get to the summary of all the results. But this was really, this is a more formal discussion of how to properly construct this general definition of the diffeomorphism invariant observables, which should be valid to all orders in general, and from there then you can particularize to this lowest order uh, in perturbation theory, but in principle this should allow you to have the definition which is valid to all orders of the diffeomorphism invariant observables. But this is a point that we are still working on to really uh, carefully check and work out all the details and make sure we fully understand everything. Okay, so the, and the summary of the main result is that uh, some of the aspects, the, the switch on scale that I was mentioning is crucial uh, is to get final results uh, and, and once one takes that into account, for instance, you realize that the, your results, for instance, change in a significant way with those that have been obtained before and for instance, you have this aspect that uh, now you recover this decoupling when, when L goes to zero as a significant, uh, a significant uh, qualitative behavior, significantly different from what you had before. Um, uh, another aspect is this growth with time, uh, which can be understood now in the following way, as compared to the result that you were naively expecting from scattering amplitude. Well, in a sense, the scattering amplitude you could interpret that, for instance, when you work in the Feynman gauge, you'd get no fluctuations, you do the calculation and for, for this part of the contribution that you could sort of identify <coughs> with the calculation for the scattering amplitude you get in that case of this, you would get a result which is zero but nevertheless because you have to, cons you have to consider this whole uh, observable which is diffeomorphism invariant then you see that you're forced to consider the whole thing not only this contribution but also the contribution that comes from the fluctuations of the proper time along the time like geodesic. And when you work in this gauge, you get a contribution which is zero here, which is sort of agrees with your naive expectation, but nevertheless the, the large contribution comes from here, from the fluctuations of the proper time of your clock along this direction. So that sort of gives you some intuition at least of what's the meaning of this large fluctuation, this growth with time of the fluctuations. Uh, and it's in a sense a, a, an unavoidable consequence of having to consider this gauge invariant observable. And uh, since I'm running out of time, maybe I'll just flash this last uh, slide about the uncertainty principle, but perhaps I won't discuss it and just leave some, some time for discussions. Thank you very much.
calculation that we need. So that's why this work is part in progress. So this calculation that we need in some more detail trying to mimic what Larry Korn had done uh, it was this essentially this delta t that they were considering. So that was important. Time. That is really not a fully diffeomorphism invariant observable. Yeah. This is in the TT gauge. It's very similar to what they were calculating. But this is not guaranteed to be gauge invariant. The one that we want to calculate and that we are in the process of calculating is, is this one. And so this would correspond to these proper times here. Okay. And then you have to make sure that uh, when you're calculating all the contributions that you get, in principle you get some additional contributions. So do you have an expression for this geometric interval? Or, or we, we are looking at all the contributions, and, uh, but we still want to make sure that we have all of them. Okay. So and, and the other one... Uh, you get, of you course, the contributions that, we, that I show, yeah. that kind of behavior. And you have other contributions, and we want to make sure that you don't have, you don't get uh, significant corrections to what okay. you had before. In particular, one thing that you have to be, that we want to be careful is that you want to make sure that you don't get corrections from cross correlation terms between this time lag. Uh, so the point is that you will have correlations from time lag, time lag, from uh, now, now, and you have to be particularly careful from cross correlations between the now. The time line. You're, you're talking about expectation values. When you calculate the two point function. Right, but even before you, you calculate the two point function, you mm -hmm. just take the expression uh, for delta t or tau um, as uh, linear functions of the metric uh -huh. So, uh, at, have you checked the gauge invariance at that level by just doing gauge translation of the metric? Uh, so, take h when you add symmetrized derivative of uh, delta t. That kind of gauge transformation with your expression is invariant under this uh, this transformation. So if if your if the, the geometric observer you define yes. uh, is if your model is invariant, uh, then the linearized approximation to it should be invariant under linear. Sorry. Sorry. So I think the the, the delta t. Um, no, the delta t. The delta t is not. It's not. Okay. But this one, uh, before you start taking although, average. Although when you look at the, um, yeah, so I agree. But when you look at the Larry Ford's paper, they try to argue, they try to yeah. argue. But they have certain, they have to do certain manipulations <laughs> because they have to switch off <laughs> the metric perturbations by hand, which they cannot do. So when they try to argue that they have gauge invariant, they have to do things which are not completely, uh, so they have to switch off the metric perturbations in a region outside which is not completely, so that's why, uh, yeah, so that's why uh, that doesn't seem, uh, that does not seem, so th they don't have to do all this construction right. here, yeah. but the, way, the reason why they don't have to do it, because they just uh, assume well, they what assume, they impose, yeah, they they the metric perturbations that, uh, are only yeah. in a region here, and they, and then yeah. outside, they are zero. They assume. But then, the, but the point is that the, the whole so, thing about so. the, the, way, the place where all these non-trivial thing about the gauge transformations will be on the boundary terms, yeah. and they will be exactly where the place where they put those things to zero. So I think that that's, yeah. Okay, but my, my point was just, before you say that the, with the, the constructed as if you want observable, it should pass, it should be able to pass this test. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Yes. It seems to me that this should be interpreted in some sense as a limitation of actually constructed constructing a collection of observers that defines an inertial frame. Right? I mean, the, the instructions of Einstein of how to construct an inertial system is, you know, send a couple of observers, send some signals, synchronize clocks. Uh -huh. What you're saying is that there is a limitation to the quantum gravity or quantum fluctuations to the actual constructions of that. In a sense, thing. yes. In a sense, yes. It, but in fact, uh, yes. But in fact, the one the, the limitation that we find is less dramatic than uh, than that. that well, okay, I, it, it was in my first slide, but than than that that has been somehow uh, suggested in the in the literature. So ours is relatively moderate as compared to. It. But yeah, I mean, perhaps the way we formulate it, it becomes very clear what we are talking about when I show this. Uh, this kind of plot, but yes, I agree with you. It, it, yes. Well, of course, uh, when you express, if I may, something here, yeah. the satellites you show are in space and they are manifestly in non-valence, uh, you know, this delta L square, 
Yes. It was just a conjecture, and yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So perhaps, so, so that's why. Yeah. So about. yeah, so that's why, you, that's why in this case it's very, it's very this is precise. explicit, and we are trying to make it very yes. So this I is very explicit. Yes, yeah, so I, I agree with you. Uh, yes. I think we need to break now for mm -hmm. the uh, coffee. Thank you.